So, everybody having a good time at the FrostCon? Enjoying himself? Nice. Um, so, welcome to my talk. Um, it's called Executable Documentation for everybody, even for you. Uh, so, I want to show a couple of things about executable documentation, what it is, and so on. But first of all, I want to know about you. Uh, like, who has never heard that term? Who, who doesn't have any connotations with it? Okay, so you, oh, that, that's quite a but. Uh, so that's like half, no less. Okay, maybe a third of the people who just want to know what the hell I'm talking about. That's good. Um, the rest of you, some hands who has heard of it, or like who, who's. Okay, only one, two, three. Okay. I know of it. Yeah, like okay, who thinks? Who, well, I mean, there's nothing less than heard of it, you know. <laughs> so, um, and who is uh, who's actually using it, or in his company and his projects? Um, okay. Depends what it means, right? Yeah, it depends on what it means. Okay, so maybe uh, I'll ask the question later again, and then you can tell me if if you're using it the same way that I see it. Because it, it means a couple of different things. So um, I'm going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to well, explain what I think uh, it is or what my definition of this whole executable documentation thing is. So I give you the why, how, and what of, um, of it. And then the second thing is I'm going to uh, present you Docs, which is a publishing tool I wrote. For exactly, uh, for exactly this, for um, executable documentation. So first, uh, a little bit about me. That's me, uh, this guy. Maybe I should draw him a hat and then people will recognize better. Um, my name is Nicholas Martens. I'm a freelancing software engineer and coach now in Berlin. Everybody, anybody from Berlin here? Oh yeah, the whole, whole left side of the, of the side. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm from the city. And you can find me on Twitter, or on the web, or also on GitHub um, if you're looking for me. But you can also find me right here uh, at the moment. And I'm also uh, co-organizing a, a coding dojo in Berlin. So the, the people from Berlin, if you ever um, wanted to know what a coding dojo is, so just look, uh, check it out. It's next Thursday. It's coming up. And uh, everybody who's ever in Berlin, um, just drop by. It's, it's really fun always. So that's what I'm doing. And uh, let me tell you the story of why I'm, I'm doing this talk, how I, like why, why this is important to me, or how this all started. Um, I have two big, uh, big uh, topics. One is software design, and the other one is testing. So I'm, I'm really into um, those two things. And when I say testing, of course, I mean automated testing. Because well, I'm a developer. Developers are lazy, and I hate doing stuff manually. Coding is hard enough. I don't want to do unnecessary testing, so I try to automate as much as possible. And um, because I also have a strong case of the not invented here syndrome, like most developers, I suppose, um, I needed to do my own mocking framework because there aren't enough mocking frameworks for PHP at the moment or ever, so I needed to do an, uh, another one. I called it Mockster, um, and this is where it all started. Actually, I put a lot of effort into this project because um, we also used it at, uh, at ResearchGate where I was working. And um, so I wanted to make this really nice. So I put a lot of effort into documentation, right? Because documentation is very important. And if anybody was here yesterday morning and saw the talk from Kore, uh, he was uh, having a lot of issues with badly documented projects. So I didn't want to ever, anybody to have this problem. So I put a lot of effort into documentation. So I, I made a readme on GitHub. This is what you do nowadays. I wrote uh, the main features, like why this is better than all the other mocking frameworks, because it clearly is. It wouldn't exist otherwise. I, um, I wrote an install uh, installation guide. I wrote a quick uh, start, where you can just copy and paste that code, basically, and, uh, and it should work. And I even wrote, like, uh, like, this is a very long basic usage. So it's like three pages, four pages long, how to use it and everything. And I, I was very happy with myself. It was, it was, like the, it was the first project um, I did mostly for myself that I actually documented that well. So I was quite content, except that it was wrong. The code I put in the example was not right. 
because I just forgot to update some API changes I did, and it wasn't in the documentation anymore, so mm, yeah, outdated documentation. Anybody ever had the problem of outdated documentation? <laughs> so, who's never had the problem of outdated documentation? Really? Okay. <laughs> okay. You just avoid it all together, so there's no, uh, very nice. So yeah, I had the same, uh, I, I had the same problem, actually, somebody pointed out to me, it's like, oh yeah, thank you for, you know, doing this nice um, basic usage and everything, but it's actually, it's a parsing error. There's a, this method doesn't exist. Uh, and I'm like, oh, that sucks. Um, so I started thinking what, what you can do, and I actually had an idea, and this is where this all started. I was like, let's take all this code from the documentation and put it into a PHP file, because then, I can just make sure that I can just ask the parser, is this, is this right or not? And of course, I didn't want to lose the nice comments I wrote, so I put them in the PHP file as well, as comments, obviously. And, um, and that's it. That's the executable documentation, because you still have the documentation of the project, and now you can run it. So you can do away with the readme. I just, uh, I just deleted it all. I mean, it's still there because of revisions and everything, but um, it's, not, it's not in the current version. And uh, I'm just executing this nice little PHP file. It's executable now. I just, I actually, I put it in my test folder and um, let uh, the CI server take care of it. So now every time I, I see um, this little green light going on, I know, okay, everything is all right. This actually still passes. And if, if I ever do the same mistake again, this will turn red. Never happened since then but um, it might. So I know if the documentation is still up to date or not. Of course, for all the, the code. The comments are still, uh, are still static, but they, uh, they're yeah, not that important if you want to make it running. So I was happy again. And that's it, that's, doc uh, that's executable documentation. Is this running away from, from what you're doing? Mine is different. Yours is different, okay. You have to tell me later how's yours. So this is, this <coughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so this is how I do it. This uh, was very fun. And um, I'm going to go a little bit into code now. Who's a developer here, like writing code for a living? Who's not? Almost, OK. So sorry about uh, code. Even more sorry that it's, <laughs> that it's cut off on the left side. But it's PHP. You just have to imagine a bunch of dollar signs here. <laughs> so uh, I cut them out. That's bad. Now, you can still read it. So. Um, this is how it looks like. This is, this is the um, code of my mocking framework. Don't get into that, but um, I just want to show you how, um, how, it's, how this is actually uh, looking like. So it's validating the syntax now. If I ever make a syntax error, if I just make a spelling error or so on, it will uh, turn red and I will know it. But then I started noticing that I can even do more because I can also validate the functionality of this mocking framework. I can just say, okay, why don't I actually do call the foo method and then assert in the end if, it, uh, if the, the two calls, the was called with and the uh, was called with bus, if they return the, the right thing, okay? Because this is still, it's still documenting how to use the, the library and it's also um, validating the functionality and a couple of people will say now, hey, I know what this is. This is a test. This is an automated test, right? And yeah, that's true. It works both ways. Usually I tell people, write your t automated test and you get your documentation for free. But this way it just happened the other way around uh, this time. I wrote the documentation and suddenly I had a test. But uh, because they're interchangeable, this actually works. works. So um, yeah, they're just uh, the same thing, basically. Documentation and testing. And now I have the proof that it works both ways. Very nice. So this obviously um, works, is very easy with libraries because well, the client of your library is a program, so it's really easy to write another program, uh, which is an automated test, to use that library, right? So this is easy. The same uh, goes for public APIs, because they have uh, other programs as clients as well. So um, I wanted to do it for, for APIs as well, I have. And I think for APIs, it's especially important because, well, I've been using, uh, I've been working a lot with, with public APIs, with HTTP, like RESTful stuff, and it's usually terribly documented. Um, anybody else has this problem with public APIs? I mean, they, um, they're just never completely co uh, documented, usually exactly the this thing I need 
is not in the uh, documentation, then I have to reverse engineer how this whole thing works. I mean, thank God oh, it's open source usually, so I can do that, but it's still a hustle. So I, I thought, you know, why don't, why don't I just use the same approach for APIs? I will have um, an um, executable documentation of this thing. I will know if it works, and, uh, and I'll be happy. So, and this can be done very easily. Um, you just, here I just request uh, some query from the endpoint foo bar, and I expect um, this answer with some data. It's a very imaginative, um, not doing much, this uh, little API, but you just can do it like this. And of course here we have a lot of unnecessary uh, boilerplate code, so to say. We have this router, which uh, of course here is already instantiated, but we need to get it from somewhere. And then uh, like we have this assert equals and everything. And this is not very readable. I mean, like for fellow developers it is, but what if somebody else wants to understand it? What if uh, some non-technical stakeholder wants to know how this API works? And then you cannot show him this and be like, okay, this is how it works. You know, it's very easy to understand. And he'll be like, what, what's this dollar sign doing there? Is this, is this money? Or like, um, he's, so this will confuse uh, most non-technical or even non-PHP programmers. So there's a really easy trick. You just wrap these ugly methods with nice rep, uh, methods. You just call it, when I request some query, you have to fill in the gap from foo bar, then the response should be some data. And now, I didn't do much, I just wrapped this one line in another line, but it, now it's suddenly readable. And, um, and the, the other nice thing is that it's using a natural language and also an ubiquitous language. Do you actually pronounce it like that? I never pronounce it. Ubiquitous, I think so. Um, meaning that everybody, this is a language everybody understands, everybody knows how to, how to, uh, to use it, and um, you have a good chance that your non-technical stakeholder at least knows what a request is and what a response is, because if he wants to, if he's interested in two APIs, he needs to know those two things at least. But he doesn't need to know what a router is or what, what the job of a router is. So here's, I, I, uh, I used different words, I changed the language, and this is a lot more readable. And um, with, this, with this little trick, you can now not only uh, write documentation for APIs or libraries, you can just write it for everything, for any program you want, any program that does anything. And uh, now I run full circle, and you might uh, ha have heard this before. This is exactly what behavior-driven development is, but an approach from the other side. You start with the documentation and you end up with um, specifying your whole system suddenly. So who knows, uh, who's familiar with behavior-driven development? Okay, that's not. Uh, who's heard example-driven development before? One, you've heard it? Who's uh, familiar or who has heard acceptance test-driven development? No? And how about agile testing? These are, yeah, okay. So it ex ex I didn't make up these words, these ex <laughs> They, they exist, they're just not very popular. Um, I guess behavior-driven development is, is by far the most popular term for this. But to me, they all mean the same thing. They all, uh, they're just describing a system using um, examples and uh, specifying it this way. I actually prefer the term, um, oh yeah, good thing I put this there. Um, I have a, I have, I don't like behavior-driven development, the word or the term because people, I've seen a lot of bad practices about it. So who's, um, usually people, when they, when they say we're doing behavior-driven development, it means we're writing slow UI tests. Who's, who's testing through the UI? Like with Selenium? You have to, okay. Do you enjoy it? You? Yeah, and probably not so fast, right? We, we made it to like that's, that's, that's what we're you, yeah, you, you're recording. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm totally on the side with uh, Uncle Bob when he says that don't don't test through the UI. 
only if you have to. If you want to test the UI itself, then you have to, obviously. But if you want to um, test any, um, any uh, policies, any business logic, don't use the UI. It's, it's the worst um, interface you can use. It's very fragile. The tests usually, I mean, you're probably facing all these problems. The tests, are e they break easily. They break for reasons that have nothing to do with the thing that you're testing because there's just too much in between. So um, when, when I'm talking about these things, please don't think about uh, Cucumber and, and Selenium and like uh, browser-based automated testing. This is not what I mean. I mean, I sh I'm talking about what I showed before, which is just describing functionalities in terms that everybody understand in a um, ubiquitous language. And um, this is why I'm usually not using uh, behavior-driven development, but I'm talking about specification by example. I like that term a lot better. And so I'll, I'll refer to it uh, with this term from now on. But you can just substitute it in your brain. If you, if you don't like that term, you can use any of the other five um, that you want. We'll understand each other. So I like specification by example because it has this word specification in it, which I think it's what really comes down to everything. You have this interchangeability of tests and documentation. They're basically the same thing. And specification is the same thing as well. It's just uh, it comes beforehand. You know, you're describing the system before you build it. Documentation describes the system after you build it. And tests describe the system in order to, uh, to validate the functionality. But it's just all descriptions of the system. So usually it goes the other way around. Usually you start with the specification, then implement it as a test, as an automated test. And then in the end, you get the documentation kind of for free because it just, um, it's the same thing, right? But it's, it's not that easy because you need a language. You need a, a form of description that fits all these three needs. And they're, they're quite different. In specification, you want to, sometimes you're not really sure what, how you're going to do it. So you cannot describe it in a very detailed way. You have to describe it kind of abstractly. And in tests, obviously, you have to be very specific because they have, you want to automate them. So they need to be uh, like very close to the, to the system you're testing language-wise. And in documentation, um, you, ha always, you have the system, so you can rely on it. You can say, we do this and do this, and then comes out. So language usually is different, but there's a way um, to unify these three, which is examples. And this is why I like the term specification by example, because it has the two main points of this whole approach, which behavior-driven development just doesn't have, but it, because it has nothing to do with like, uh, like behavior-driven. It means like driven by behavior. I never really got it. Um, then North is not happy with this term anymore, neither. Um, and he came up with it. But um, examples is like the main point. Because as it turns out, it's a really nice um, tool to communicate with each other. And I put here on the left side, uh, on the right side is the developer guy, okay, stereotype. Um, and the left side is the business guy stereotype. So he was obviously. And um, these two parties have a lot of times trouble understanding each other because they speak different languages, almost. They have different concerns. Programmers, they're concerned about the detail, all the aki that they really love, you know, getting their hands dirty and stuff. Um, usually, and um, business people, they have to think about you know, how money mostly, how to make money, how to contain money, how to strategy and stuff like that. Very, very different levels. So communication is hard. And if we use, we used examples, or that's the idea behind a specification by example, in order to, to bridge this communication gap. And an example is, is just that, we already had it. When I request some query, then I should get some data. This is just, this is a very simple example. So it's not hard um, to formulate these, but it's really hard to come up with these. And we've been doing that um, for like a, a year or so at, um, at, uh, at the research gate at the company I was working. And it turns out that's like the biggest problem, to come up with good key examples. And um, the concept of key example works kind of like this. Let's say you want to uh, describe this triangle Instead of just this, like drawing the whole triangle, you can also just concentrate on these edges, and you still have the triangle specified there, and you can almost see it visually, right? Um, but you only concentrate on the important things, on, on, uh, on the edges. 
let's say, don't take that literally, because if you only use edge cases, um, that's not a good specification either. But it kind of works like this. But still, um, that's, that's by far the hardest part. Like, um, who's, who's using behavior-driven development or like specification, by example, any of that approach in developing regularly? Very, just one, two? Okay, three. Is it like, how is your experience with coming up with examples? Okay. Many what? Helper. Ah, helper. Um, so uh, you're saying that you're using um, it for UI testing mostly, so you don't come up with the examples. It's more like QA, so you uh, um, you click through it. It's the normal usage of the system you're you're testing, you're automating. Okay. So. Yeah, but writing unit tests with data providers, that's very close to it. It's just that the formulation is different. The language, um, the words you're using is different, but the approach is very similar, right? But, um, but that's, the, that's exactly the, the difference, is unit tests are usually written for programmers, and these tests, they're written for everybody, so everybody should understand them. And um, this is why I like it. So you can combine these two things. Um, I just want to show you like uh, how what I mean with examples. So I'm going to give you examples of examples. Um, and let's say we're working at uh, like Amazon or some uh, you know merchandise company. And um, this is us. We're like the, the programmers. And our boss comes to us and is like, uh, you know, I have an idea. Let's uh, give free delivery to all the VIP customers. So you know we have more incentive for VIP customers. And um, but uh, let's say only for five articles and only if it's books, right? And then he goes like, bye, thanks. Um, and you're like, what uh, should I do now? And this is not even that far-fetched, I, I, like in my experience. A lot of times, you really just get like a little sheet. I mean, everybody's crazy about these uh, user stories now, right? And they're supposed to specify the whole thing. Like you write on, on one uh, tiny card what it's, what it's supposed to do. And then you just do it, doesn't work. So let's, have, let's uh, describe the same thing with examples. First example would be a VIP customer with five books in the card gets free delivery. That's like the, um, the canonical case. But a VIP customer with four books in the car uh, doesn't get free delivery, obviously. And a regular customer with five books doesn't get free delivery neither because it's only for VIP customers. But if he has five washing machines in his card, he's not supposed to get free delivery neither. So that's actually something that wasn't specified before, right? Because you only said, OK, with five articles, but only books, but you, like, um, you weren't sure, for example, about this case. Like, if he has five books and a washing machine, should he still get free delivery or not? Or should he get free delivery for the books but not for the washing machine? What should we do in this case? And um, this, is, this is the nice thing about uh, writing examples like that, that you actually start thinking about it in, in this detailed way, and you can communicate um, with, your, uh, with your client uh, about edge cases like this. And you actually come up with them way faster then when you just go down coding, because then you find these edge cases while coding, and this way you find them beforehand, which is, uh, in my uh, experience, the biggest advantage about this approach. This, this is very similar to the, uh, the example, the scenarios that you have in Gherkin. Also very good. This is exactly the same thing as the scenarios you have in Gherkin. But I didn't want to use the buzzwords yet. <laughs> so, I, um, but this is exactly the same thing. Um, so, uh, every, who knows Gherkin, this whole cucumber? Okay, so um, that don't worry, you, you'll see it later, what, uh, what, what this is. Um, well, now you have these nice examples, and uh, you can put them in a structure. You can, for example, put them in a table. Um, you can just say, okay, let's have a column for uh, the customer uh, type what his order is, and what the delivery should be. So you have the typical input-output description of a system. And every system can be described using his input and his output. This is what a system is by definition. 
And then you can just fill up the table. You can say, okay, VIP guy, VIP customer with five books should be free, VIP with four books should not be free, and so on. The, um, just what I wrote down in sentences before. And um, so you just, you see you have three variables or three, um, yeah, that you, uh, two input variable, one output variable, and you can use tables, and people are doing this, for example, uh, fitness or fit is a tool that does that. It's more like Java people, anybody using fit or fitness for that sort of stuff? Okay. You're really doing everything, are you? <laughs> Okay, so, so you're mixing acceptance tests and unit tests, yeah. and you... Okay, and for integration tests or acceptance tests, you use this way. And this is a really nice format, because it's, you can see it, uh, you can read it very easily, you can see if something is wrong and why, um, but it's not very flexible. That's why I prefer sentences, also because I can write them in code. Uh, like this, and it's way more flexible. So you just you just write, uh, you just come up with these uh, helper methods, as you say. But they're okay; they're totally fine because they help you. You just write, given I, I am a VIP customer, um, and given I have you know five books in my basket, so this is PHP, so we cannot have any infix notation, so we have to do it like this. Uh, when I check my delivery options, then the delivery should be free, and this describes this um, scenario exactly. And also, it's very flexible. You just have to write a couple of methods, but that's not hard, right? We do this all the time. Um, and they're not even that hard to implement. Uh, so this is like the business perspective. You just, uh, and I've, by the way, um, I've been using exactly this and I've been showing uh, like the, the business stakeholders of uh, ResearchGate this code. And they were not very happy in the beginning, but after two or three weeks, they actually started being able to read it, and they could read it just as well as anything else, even with this weird notation of having, you know, in, like replaced infix. They, they were fine with it, so this actually worked. And I was quite surprised by it, because I thought, you know, I'd never get them to read code, but they did. Um, they were in-house, they were the product managers. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I could uh, try these weird experiments. I don't think uh, you can do that with external customers. Be like, here, read this code. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I have, I have a better solution, um, as you'll see in a second. <laughs> so um, just for the, like, if anybody's interested in that, uh, like how you would actually um, implement these methods, uh, you fake the input as good as you can, uh, or you just use uh, real entities uh, like the customer, then you make him VIP, and in the, um, in the books in my basket method, you create a basket instance and um, just fill it with books. Really, really straightforward stuff. Um, then you, add, um, you need some class uh, or some instance that decides whether or not the delivery should be for free. So I call this the delivery manager. And we just create this delivery manager, give him the customer in the uh, basket and ask him, should this, be, should this delivery be free or not? And the third thing, uh, is just checking, validating uh, the output. I state the delivery should be free. So in PHP unit speak, this is assert true, this is free. Um, as I say, uh, well, this line could uh, also be in the test because I think it's almost readable, right? Uh, even for non-technical people. But um, if, you, uh, if you write, then the delivery should be free, that's even more readable. Um, so it's not there's, there's no magic behind it. Like this is um, if if you're using behead or cucumber, um, this is what what they do, right? They just match sentences to snippets of code, but uh, you don't need a tool to do that because every programming language already knows how to match a sentence to a snippet of code, and it's called a method. So um, I never had the need of uh, using behead for that. And yeah, and this is uh, specification by example. Uh, f for me, how I define it, and how I've been using it a lot. And I've been using it for, for two years now. And uh, for all my own projects, I always specify them this way. And um, it works really nicely. I haven't done it too much with uh, clients yet, because um, it's still a lot of educational work you have to do with the clients. Um, because, uh, well, 
yeah, you have to write these uh, examples in be beforehand, and um, that means you have to start thinking about what you want to do before you do it. And I, a lot of people don't like thinking about what they want to do. They just they love just dumping everything on on the programmers. They don't like thinking about what they actually want to do. Um, but uh, it's, it totally pays off once you get there. So uh, there's also a book uh, with the title Specification by Example. This is why I call it this way. Uh, it's a really nice book uh, when it comes to describing the terms, when it comes to well, making up new terms mostly. Um, it's, it doesn't help with uh, how to use it. It doesn't, like, uh, it doesn't explain very well or at all. Um, how how to how to implement it in in your own project or something like that, but it, it describes the whole process really nice and it um, describes a lot of other teams who are using it and, and their experience with it, but it doesn't say how they use it exactly. Um, so uh, oh yeah, this is the subtitle or the, the how you call it the subcaption here is how successful teams deliver the right software, and um, I think this is a really nice sentence. It's, no surprise this is on the cover uh, because it's the hardest thing is usually to do the right uh, software not to um, and I describe it like this okay this is uh, us again this is the developer poor guy because uh, he has to work with the machines um, they're really stupid and we have to teach them something that's terrible but it gets even worse we also have to talk to, to all the business guys who hate uh, thinking about what they want to do, they usually don't know what they want, we have to figure it out, and then uh, they change their minds all the time, so it's terrible. So we have two main purposes, we have, well, obviously we're the one doing everything, we have to do the thing right, we have to create bug-free or error-free software, which is hard enough, but even harder sometimes, yeah, right thing, uh, it says, hard to read. We have to build the right thing, because if we, like the best error-free uh, feature, full featured software is completely worthless if nobody wants it, if nobody needs it, and if it's not, if it's just not the right thing. And um, so this is really hard to do. Usually, it's hard to figure out what the right thing is for the business people, but some are really good. But then we have to understand what they think the right thing is, right? So. To make sure that we implement correctly, we use automated tests. This is a really nice way to make sure your software works as you intend. But that doesn't mean it works as this guy intends. So what we do then is we write specification usually. And um, well, this, this is what, uh, what we did in the 80s, right? The whole waterfall approach is like we wrote uh, pages and pages of specification that specified everything, and then we implemented it and, and threw away the specification basically because it was wrong every, anyways. And then we wrote pages and pages and pages of documentation, which we also had to throw away every, every like two years or something like that because it was outdated. And um, but using uh, like using the executable approach, uh, they they just transform. You just write the specification and then you implement it as tests, and then documentations come out at the end. So it helps you uh, to to do the right thing, not only the thing right, but the right thing. And um, as I said, how I do it is I just write code for the specifications because that's okay because developers are still involved. So, um, so as I said, I don't quite follow the approach of, of Cucumber uh, where you write uh, text files, plain text files with the with um, scenarios in a domain specific language and then that gets parsed and then you have this huge tool that does nothing but parsing sentences um, so code comes out of it, and this is completely unnecessary because programming languages already um, are capable of describing these things. And also, um, and I think like uh, Cucumber or like Behat, they always say, well, but this way, the business stakeholders can write the scenarios themselves, right? But I've never seen that happening. I, I don't believe this will ever happen. Has anybody ever seen this happening? Like a completely non-technical person writing a test scenario themselves? Me neither. So also they, they cannot do this and they should not do this. The, um, the, the business stakeholder shouldn't write the scenarios, the specification themselves. And the developer shouldn't write the specification themselves neither. This needs to be a collaborative process. This needs to be done together. 
with as many people as possible, um, with, with many, as many roles as possible. So just the analysts should be involved in writing the specification, the QA people should be involved in writing the specification because everybody has his unique approach, his unique uh, perspective on things. So uh, in order to write a good specification, we can only do it together. So why not do it in code? Because um, it's easy. But then the documentation can be read by non-technical people themselves and should be able to because we're using a ubiquitous language, we're using a language everybody knows, so they don't need, they shouldn't need a developer to find out how the system works. And before, or in every project uh, that we weren't employing um, the executable documentation, I got at least like every day or every other day the call asking, so how does the system work again? Like, can you please describe it to me? And of course I didn't know anymore because what do I know what I did two weeks ago? So I had to go through the code and, and read and re reverse engineer how everything works and then you know, come back uh, to, to whoever called me and describe it to them. And I hated doing that because I hate reading code and I hate reading my own code. That's like, so I, I needed a way to avoid uh, constantly having to look up again how things work. And um, this is why I just gave those people access to, um, to the, to the uh, code that described the system. But um, I don't, that was not an ideal approach because uh, it was still hard for them to read it. It was hard for them to find it. They had to actually install Git on their computer and, and check out the repository, which was like several hundred thousand files. And then they had to, like, uh, it, I was not ideal. So what we did instead is um, we made an HTML output of this, um, uh, of this documentation, of this code. And uh, we, it was very ad hoc, and, um, but it still worked nicely enough. So it did nothing else but parse the files and, and show them quite nicely in, in HTML. But um, then after I talked about specification, by example, last year at the FrostCon, we talked afterwards. And uh, people were like, yeah, it's, you know, it's really nice uh, having all this code, but why not show it as HTML and why not make a, uh, like a tool, an open source tool for it? And I thought, yeah, actually good idea, let's do it. So I started doing it and um, this year I actually have it. So, and I can talk about this. this. I think this is really nice. This is basically, did anybody um, see last year's me at last year? Okay, one, yeah, you obviously. <laughs> so this is the, um, nice. Uh, so this is the follow-up on it, okay? If you, if you, maybe you remember it, we, I, I said, okay, yeah, I really want to do a program that exports it um, as HTML so people can read it on their own. Um, and then once you have this, once you have this nice uh, browser for source code, everybody can read it and you, you have a single source of truth, which is a very nice side product of executable documentation because people stop discussing unnecessary stupid things, like how does the system work. A lot of times, if you ask three people, how does this like email work? When is it triggered or what does it contain? You get three different answers because nobody knows. Everybody thinks they know, but nobody does know. The only, body, uh, the only instance you have with, that is actually true is the code usually. And that's only accessible to developers and even like, yeah, as I said, I didn't like writing it, uh, reading it. But um, if you have this documentation that you know is true because it's self-validating, um, everybody can agree to it. And the second nice um, side effect is that you also you unify the language. Okay? So um, I don't know, we had one entity called topic, but it was also called keyword or post. It had like five different names, but it was the same entity. And, and re, re, uh, depending on if you asked a developer of this team or of this team or the marketing, you had like five different words for the same concept, for the same entity. And that was very confusing a lot of times. And um, if you have the single source of truth, if you have this executable documentation, um, people have to, uh, to agree on one language, on one term for things because it's code and it doesn't like ambiguity. ambiguity. Um, was it? No. Well, double meanings, anyways. <laughs> uh, so now, yeah, I think it's a good time um, to, to show it actually uh, to you how it looks like. Well, that's a little bit too far ahead. Um, just wanted, first I wanted to show you, is this seeable? Yeah, what the hell. Okay, this is the documentation as it was of, uh, of Moxta. 
So as you can see, I really put a lot of effort in it. Um, it has like color coding and everything. And um, what I did then is I uh, I put the intro. Uh, I wrote a test file called introduction test, where I put um, and uh, I have a lot of of other tests. So this is actually the specification of the whole library. Um, it shows you how to uh, create mock how to filter uh, functions, how the injection works, and you have this introduction test. And then uh, what I do with it, I just parse it, uh, I just read the, um, read the files and uh, show them in, uh, in a nicely readable way. So check return value test.php becomes just check return value. And uh, also on the right side, you have these little green numbers which indicate how many test cases are in this file and how many are passing or failing or incomplete. So um, it's also integrated with the CI server that just um, sends, I'm using Travis CI and uh, at the end I just have a, um, a curl call that sends the um, report from PHP unit to, um, to docs and then that is parsed and matched up with the, um, with the test cases. So it also gives you uh, an overview of how of the project state, like if you have a lot of incomplete tests or which features are still incomplete. Because um, yeah, you can like you can think of each file as a description of, of one specific feature. And then when you open the um, the introduction test.php, is that readable? Yeah, right. It looks like this. You have um, here, the public function test basic usage. So it uh, needs to be called test because I didn't want to change my PHP unit uh, settings. Uh, so it finds it still as a um, as a executable function. And then I create my uh, a bunch of class definitions that I need in order to um, to work with it. So I define your class, and I do this in an uh, Evo. So um, I can do it uh, like again and again. And then in the end, and here um, I just yeah, create a mock factory. I uh, get the mock. And as you can see, the comments are, uh, are written in Markdown. Uh, so they can contain yeah, any, uh, but they also um, can contain HTML and stuff. It's all displayed then. And this is how it looks like. So we have these, um, in introduction test, we have three methods that are displayed um, as three sections and they are also colored green because they're passing. If not, they would be red. And then um, the markdown, the comments are passed as uh, markdown and displayed as HTML. You can also do like nice uh, JavaScript thingy. So I hide the class definitions because they're huge and ugly and uh, usually you can infer them from, uh, from the code itself. Um, so yeah. So this is, looks almost exactly like the README from GitHub, but it's actually executable, so I know if it's wrong. And uh, it's also nicely browsable because uh, you have all these, uh, all the, the classes on the left side, and you can um, just yeah, access functions like this. And I also wanted to show other um, specifications. So this is the introduction test is kind of special because it has a lot of comments. It describes the system uh, like uh, from the bird perspective and um, it's like I, it has a lot of uh, yeah, comments. It, I talk a lot about the system. It doesn't have that much code. But the other test cases or specifications um, have, uh, have more code. So they read, uh, is that, maybe it make it a little bit bigger. Where is the nice one? Well, let's, let's do the first one. Um, so here you just have uh, the create uh, mock text uh, test. And then I say, OK, given this class definition, when I create the mock, then its property A should be B, and so on. So I describe the system um, just in words, even though I could, because it's a library, so I, I could just write the code, and it would still be very readable, and maybe even better readable because uh, you could just copy paste it as I did in the introduction test. But this way uh, actually helps myself because I can, like, um, I can read it better myself and also people foreign to the project who don't know the internals and don't want to know the internals uh, 
can uh, can understand it. And then um, this is uh, this gets also parsed, of course, and it shows um, it's displayed like that. And as you can see, I um, at this point I also parse the code and display it in a different way. I I strip the the this and I also um, turn the camel casing into into space sentences, and I fill in the um, the the arguments which are usually in the end. So here it says, then the property called should be false. So it's you don't have to do the underscore replacement in your head, which I, which I think is uh, is a really nice thing too. So you can you can do that too. You can you can parse your code in any way you want. If you have uh, if you use this for an API, for example, you can you can even have uh, like um, a specific field uh, for the request and a specific field for the response. So they are also uh, very uh, like easily understandable or like uh, displayed in an easy to understand way, <coughs> so you can do anything with it. Um, and yeah, this is just uh, way easier to read uh, than than the code, I think. And it's also so, yeah, people usually like that better than the code. Everybody who is not programmer definitely. Um, so any any questions to that or like um, anything you you want to see here? Well, I mean, it's public. You can just click around, edit yourself <coughs> if you want. I'll do it. OK. So that was uh, just a really quick demo. And uh, how it's done, it's uh, not much magic. I just uh, take the PHP file. I parse it um, into a structured format uh, containing the class or the methods, the content um, with the mark uh, markdown and everything. <clears throat> and then I just um, output as, it as uh, HTML. All of this is done um, on demand right now, so directly I don't do any caching um, because I don't need to because um, well, it's very static anyway and still fast enough. But of, of course this could uh, be heavily cached so then it would show instantly. Um, oh yeah, like in, in case uh, anybody cares, I'm using the PHP parser from uh, Nikita. It's uh, very nice. It has a little. Um, well, it's, it works uh, very nicely. And it's fast enough. And um, Markdown parser I use uh, parse down from Erusef, just where credit is due. So this is the pipeline. Um, really easy. So just to recap, we're almost done here. Uh, specification by example or behavior-driven development is about communication between these two um, parties, between the developer, between the technical staff and the non-technical staff. This is a problem that a lot of companies have, that, like, depending on the size and, and the culture to different extents, but I've seen this everywhere, uh, that it's just really hard for these two people or two parties to communicate with each other, and there are a lot of misunderstandings, which leads to frustration, which leads to worse, worse products. So it's, it helps a lot to streamline uh, the way people think about it and um, to, they communicate about it. And we do this using examples because this is uh, a format that is universally uh, applicable and um, is on, you can have examples in any level of detail. You can very, have very abstract high level examples and you can describe very detailed specific um, parts of a system using examples but it's always the same approach uh, no matter on what abstraction level you are. So like you can use this for, PH, uh, for unit tests as well as for integration tests. You can always have the same format, which just makes it a lot easier uh, to approach. And um, yeah, we, uh, examples are specification, our tests and our documentations at the same time. And you transform the specifications into automated tests using this um, method, specification by example. And then um, you can use docs to access the, the documentation yourself. But yeah, that's actually optional. You can just read the code as well. That already helps. Yeah, I think that's it, but not quite. There you go. Um, as I said, well, I didn't talk uh, too much about specification by example today. But if you are interested in it, then just uh, read the book, uh, which I showed. Yeah, this doesn't work anymore. Um, or uh, check out uh, what Dan North says about it because um, he came up with the term as far as, uh, as I found out. And I think uh, what he says is still very close to the original meaning and is not too much um, spoiled by the whole uh, cucumber behead um, approach. 
And he also has a very good talk. If you, if you don't like reading too much, if you like watching talks, um, this is uh, called How to Sell BDD to the Business. And um, it's, it's a very good explanation um, how this, uh, yeah, even for non-technical people. For example, if you want to convince uh, your, your uh, boss, um, then you can show him this talk or just send him to me. Uh, and while I'm giving out um, goodies, uh, everybody should read Clean Code. Who has not read Clean Code by Uncle Bob? Okay, do so. <laughs> if you're programming, it's really, I read it every four years. Um, it's just like you forget things and it's just, uh, well, I forget things. <laughs> and um, if you're into Agile and stuff, uh, you should definitely check out Extreme Programming, which is like the, the father of Agile and still in its purest form, I think. And um, also I, I can recommend uh, The Lean Startup. It's a book um, about uh, yeah, stopping waste. And I think the whole Agile movement and this uh, executed book documentation is a very agile uh, um, method as well because it's just the idea is to stop waste. So to waste it is if you write a specification and then throw it away later, then you just wasted a lot of brain power and a lot of paper too or whatever. So um, whenever we don't uh, produce things we, we, we throw away later, whenever we have uh, active artifacts that we can reuse, we have less waste and more fun with everything. Well, that was it. If you want to uh, check it out uh, yourself, it's, you can find it at docs.artens.org. You can find it on GitHub. You can fork it, uh, whatever you want. Um, and you can find this presentation and, um, well, lots of other things at artens.org as well. I'll upload it hopefully tomorrow or maybe even tonight. Then you can, um, if you want to uh, read the links again and stuff. So thank you very much. If you want, I can do a really quick five minute demo <laughs> of the tool that we've done. Okay, let's see how many questions uh, oh, we have. Yeah, sure. And then uh, we know. So, are there any questions? Yes. So the question is if I can show um, what the business would see. And this is what I, what I showed here. Um, and it, it, ver it depends very much on the domain. And um, this is usually very readable to domain experts because they know the words and they're into it. Uh, if, I just, if you ever used um, a, a mocking library, then you will understand uh, like what a class definition is and when I create a mock. But this is usually what I show to them. Yeah. I, I don't. You mean the, the code that I implement? Um, like, like this. So this is what the business users see. I don't show them the code. I don't show them how I implement it. Um, I just show them the, the specification. Or I don't show it to them. Usually we come uh, up together and create it together. So they're I, I don't just show it to them, and but I like I, if they're interested in the code, if they're coders themselves, then then I usually show this part. But that's never the case, actually. Okay. Yes. Do you have experience uh, with this uh, thing and the other languages? Did you try to to do this with a German customer or something like this? Okay. So. If, if I'm using this approach with other languages as not English or as Ruby? Hmm? Um, yes, I've actually, I've done a, um, a coaching with a, with a guy who didn't like English that much. And um, I, I introduced him to um, specification by examples and he preferred German. So, uh, but it was a little bit awkward. So we wrote, uh, angenommen, es gibt eine Klassendefinition when das passiert, dann sollte das passieren. So there are equivalent keywords and you can just sort of translate it. But if you're referring to whether or not uh, umlaute are presented correctly uh, and parsed correctly, I don't know, actually, I haven't tried it out. But I mean, that, yeah, if, if you find that it not works, you can just patch it. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the difference between this and uh, test driven development? 
Um, so where the difference be like the, between behavior-driven development and test-driven development, it's very similar. Um, the difference is that in test-driven development, you write automated tests in code that uh, only programmers can read. And behavior-driven development, that's, that's, the idea, that's, the change, that's, the, uh, that's basically the only change. It has, a lot of, um, it has a lot of implications, that one change, but that's, that's the basic change, or at least for me. I, I bet if you ask different people, they may maybe ask, uh, answer different things, but that's, that's what it's, the main difference is to me. Okay. Any questions else?